Um, hello everybody, welcome back to Boost and Reviewed. We have a special guest with us today, and we're having Margaritas with Margarita Montemore. Woo! Very excited. Woo! Very excited. Yeah! Woo! -hoo. Mm -hmm. Cheers to that. Woo! -hoo. Yes, cheers. <laughs> So, I've been boring with water, but I am mentally, there's a margarita in here. I, I guess I'm bringing the margarita, right? Yeah, exactly. You are the margarita. Exactly. <laughs> um, so uh, do you want to introduce yourself? So I'm sure everybody in the book world knows who you are, but uh, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? <laughs> I sincerely doubt that, but very much appreciate your uh, how, how, how much you think of me by saying that. Uh, so I am Margarita Montemore. I am the author of Asleep From Day and Una Out of Order, and most recently, Acts of Violet. Um, and Una Out of Order was selected as a Good Morning America book club pick and is currently in development. Um, by Amazon for a television series, which is very, very exciting. And uh, yeah, and I'm, I've, Acts of Violet came out just earlier this month. It came out July 5th. So I am just very, very excited to have my, my new girl out in the world and to be talking about all things magic and books and anything and everything else that may come up. And on a total side note, I love that the three of us are all representing like cool glasses. It's yeah. like a fun <laughs> yes. glass convention here. So I love <laughs> both of your looks there. Oh, thank you. thank you. We love yours. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, so, uh, what inspired you to become an author, and when did you know the writing was gonna that writing was gonna be your niche, like your whole? Good question. I would say it isn't so much inspiration as much as writing is something that I have done since I was a child. My mom loves telling the story of how we were in a stationery store when I was six, I think, or maybe seven, and I found this Hello Kitty diary, which mm -hmm. I still have uh, across the room and with a lock on it because, you know, six-year-olds have many <laughs> private and secret thoughts that must be kept treasured. And I just begged and begged for my parents to buy this Hello Kitty diary for me. So I was keeping diaries from a very, very young age. And then um, the journaling kind of evolved into some poetry and prose. And I would say what really kind of flip the switch for me from this is just something I do because I love it. And, you know, I also love to read to this is what I want to dedicate my life to. That probably came around age 16 when I took this amazing creative writing class that like, imagine if the breakfast club was a writing class where it didn't <laughs> matter if you were like the outcast weirdo or the popular kid or the jock, like everybody was equal in this writing class and it really felt like it gave all of us this voice and I felt like oh my gosh like I can finally express myself in a way I've never been able to before and it just it just being in that environment and and kind of it opened up this writer real writer side of me and uh yeah and then from then on I studied creative writing in college and worked other jobs as <laughs> authors do even after they're published. But, uh, you know, finally after kind of working in everything from insurance to publishing to social media, and um, I finally just kind of decided to make the big leap, focus on it full time, and here we are. Yeah. Um, what's a fun fact about yourself that maybe your fans don't know? Okay, non-writing related. Uh, I am a very clumsy person <laughs> and have just barely any physical dexterity. I will find the invisible hole <laughs> in crack in the sidewalk, like walk into walls. My death perception is terrible. And yet I am really surprisingly good with a hula hoop and I even <laughs> won a hula hoop contest once like I can keep that thing going I haven't tried it in a while but I feel like if somebody gave me a hula hoop now like I would just my body would just remember and we'd be off to the races so 
that's my little completely useless talent. <laughs> yes. Interesting. That's awesome. I cannot. That's so hard. That's like a I can't really even hard. ride a bike. But I can <laughs> what is wrong with that? It's just messed up. Oh my goodness. That's so impressive. Um <laughs> that's so fun. If you had to choose, who is your favorite author or your autobi authors? Okay. It, they're different because my favorite authors are the ones I feel like have influenced me deeply as a writer. And those would be Margaret Atwood, Milan Kundera, and Oscar Wilde. And just for very different reasons, just especially Margaret Atwood, I worship at, at her altar and just like how she's she's crossed genres. She writes about women in the most extraordinary way, her imagination, her craft, everything about her. Uh, Milan Kundera, he breaks the cardinal rule of show, don't tell. So he, in kind of early in my writing life, sort of instilled this little rebellious streak of like, okay, learn the rules, but then look how you can bend or even break them. And look at like how you can just infuse so many ideas and philosophies and, you know, just have a story that's so much more than just plot and characters. Um, and then Oscar Wilde, I mean, his one-liners are better than some people's entire novels. So, um, <laughs> Just the, the wit and um, just and the the notion that he was even more clever in person, uh, and that anything that he put down that to paper that we still read today is like nowhere near the level of um, of of wit that he had in real life. So that just that helps me try to also like infuse of that level of of humor and cleverness but also human observation into what i write uh as far as auto buys authors i mean i will read pretty much anything that leon moriarty or um taylor jenkins read puts out and mm -hmm. i love their their <laughs> blend of kind of the really really great hooks and characters and stories that and they straddle that like area of it's book club fiction but it's you know it's it's both commercial and literary like I very much aspire to be kind of on the same shelves as as those two authors so really enjoy their work I think you will I don't know why you already <laughs> aren't you're writing so well like good we loved Una and we loved Acts yes. of Violet so thank you you're welcome um, I am reading Acts of Violet right now I'm not finished with it but I am most of the way through it and i'm hooked yeah i'm curious what all those little orange little stickies are the i see that you <laughs> kind of oh mark my these are so that's danielle <gasps> this is danielle's doing when she read wow and so i can tell when something's like super important coming up i'm like on the page and i'm like okay i can't read it i need to like read everything else and then i can't skip down and then i peel it off underneath <laughs> it, put it right back um but yeah danielle attacked this book yeah nice. i'm mostly through it i have some theories but i will not share <laughs> okay no spoilers no then. spoilers no absolutely spoilers. not <laughs> um if you had to choose what was your favorite book that you've written and why Oh, I honestly, I can't I, like, it's impossible. Yeah. You know, I love all my children equally. Like I, I, and I'm not even exaggerating. I don't have any biological children. Um, and I, for me, I feel like my books are the closest thing to actually having children. So it, it's really like, you're Sophie's choicing me here. <laughs> I, honestly, um, you know, I, I like to think that, you know, every book that I that I write, I completely pour my heart and soul into. So I try to get better with each book. I try to challenge myself with each book. Um, but picking a favorite, I mean, I can't. Like, they're, you know, they're all different and they all mean so much to me in different ways. So, like... I'm sorry to cop out, but oh no, that's <laughs> no, that's a good answer. Make them to choose. <laughs> is there is there one that maybe was more fun to write in the sense of like Uno was more time travelly? Acts of mm -hmm. Violet is definitely like the magic side of everything. 
if if it's yeah. still not either of them, that's totally fine too. <laughs> I'll be honest. Uh, yeah, I mean, of course. It, it, Aspects of all of them were fun to write. And like my first book, Asleep from Day, I, I will say it was the one I self-published. It was fun because um, it's set in Boston in 1999. And I went to Emerson College, represent, um, <laughs> in the late 90s. And I it was like four of the best years of my life. So revisiting that time and place during one of the happiest periods of my life was a lot of fun because it's like, I say it's uh, not autobiographical, but it's 100% like geographically autobiographical. And a lot of those places that I write about don't exist anymore. So so it's both like my time capsule and love poem to Boston, as, especially like at this particular period of time. So so that was, um, that was fun. Ooh. Okay. Okay. Um... So what brings you inspiration for the stories you write? Like, what is the thing that made you write Una and Acts of Violet and um, Asleep from Day? Wow. Okay. That's a big question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, to piggyback off what I was just saying, Asleep from Day, I started when I was kind of going through a rough period of my life. So I needed a happy place to retreat to. So kind of thinking back on this really wonderful time in my life and then, you know, creating writers, what do we do? We create characters. We hope that readers will love and then completely ruin their lives in as many <laughs> possible ways as we can to make this story interesting. Uh, so, you know, so that kind of started from, I think it started from a place of needing to retreat and then all right now now that we're here let's create a real story uh una was me nearing the age of 40 and still feeling like a 19 year old on the inside <laughs> and kind of turning that over in my head of like mismatching ages internally externally i couldn't write a time travel novel and yet here are all of these I, and then one day brainstorming with my husband i'm like what about a woman who every year she like leaps into her own body at a different age. And he's heard me spout so many different mm -hmm. concepts and ideas and is always supportive, but this is the one he just like sat up and we both kind of looked at each other and he said, that's the one. And um, then Violet was kind of, I would say like a mashup of things that I personally find interesting and, um, but I wanted to present in a way that I hoped had never been done before. So it was written off of a many years long obsession with podcasts and having listened to many, many, and not just true crime, but paranormal and uh, fun, like pop culture podcasts. Uh, it was that and my own, yes, interest with not not all true crime, most, well, let's be honest, most true crime, <laughs> unsolved disappearances kind of, they hook me in a way that I find both maddening and just so intriguing. And then I also love any kind of like showbiz, especially dark side of showbiz story. Mm -hmm. And then once I kind of tapped into like, okay, well, it can't just be like a missing person story. I don't want to make it like dark or a, like a full on thriller. It still needs to have some quirk and fun to it. So once I landed on, wait a second, what if the celebrity is a magician? Everything just sort of fell into place. Um, do you have a rec for a true crime, crime podcast that we need to listen to? Oh, gosh. Um, Though I will say the ones that I listen to, the the ones about like unsolved disappearances too that I think are really great are Trace Evidence and uh, The Trail Went Cold. Okay. Those were two great ones. But having said that, uh, the two that probably directly inspired Acts of Violet the most were um, Missing on 9-11, which is a deep dive. I love deep dive podcasts. And that one, I don't know if you're familiar with Sneha Phillips, the woman who mm -hmm. she disappeared 
uh, right around the time. Basically, nobody heard from her from September 10th onward of 2001. And so she's presumed to have been killed in, you know, killed on 9-11 because she was, um, I believe, a doctor or she was in the medical field. At the same time, she had a lot of problems professionally, personally, in her marriage. And there are some who believe she may have chosen that moment to kind of disappear and start a new life. Whoa. So yeah, that's, that's exactly, crazy. Exactly. Yes. Whoa. So ooh, I get like chills just thinking about this case. There's so many layers to it. It's so fascinating. And then um, another podcast that's not true crime, but is uh, like kind of scratches that pop culture mystery itch that I love is called Wind of Change. And it's about, I don't know if you've ever heard that song by the Scorpions. It's one of the biggest rock songs of all time. Um, and this song, there's kind of the question that this podcast tries to answer is whether this song was actually written by the CIA. Uh -oh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's bananas. It's like, yeah, it's so crazy. And it's also like, it's the kind of, I guarantee you just clear half a day to listen to the whole thing. Because once you start listening to it, you're just going to want to blow through it. That's cool. Stuff like that is yeah. so intriguing. All like the conspiracy theories and the oh, deep dives. But the fun conspiracy theories. Yeah, not the ones know? that are like, like scary. Yeah. <laughs> not the ones that people can die from. The ones <laughs> yeah. that are like, who wrote this song? Yes, you know? yeah. Because manufacturer of glitter, or rather a uh, customer, you know, like the glitter mystery, things that are, you know, not so consequential. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's fair. That's yes, fair. Yes, for sure. As someone who loves true crime, I will be adding those to my podcast list for sure um i want to know your favorites now too because i haven't uh, been i've been watching more documentaries so uh we can if you want to send me a list later on that's sure. cool too but i'm always looking absolutely for a, a recommendations yeah um i think a big one is definitely crime junkie that one is mm -hmm. pretty um the plagiarism thing made me stop listening to it. So I haven't been Whoa. able to return since then, I, I will say. But I will be open to any other. <laughs> no, 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 that's fair. I don't know I what just, you're talking as about. As a writer, so. any kind of plagiarism uh, controversy around anything makes me immediately um, hesitant. Fair. So, But I'm sure you've got like loads of others too. Yes, I will definitely send you a list. And I have to look into that because this is the first I've heard of that. So, oh, yeah. I will look into it. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> okay. No worries. No worries. <laughs> um, what is one book that you're excited to read this summer or this year that you haven't already? Um, okay. So, asking me to just name one is a little mean. <laughs> no, so, uh, I will say Siren Queen by Nevo oh. is very high on my list. Like I said, any kind of showbiz story. So you have a Chinese American actress in old Hollywood, which my goodness, I love the old Hollywood movies. So it's just like, just here, take my money. Um, <laughs> I'm also very excited for uh, Just Like Home by Sarah Gailey. I loved their last book, The Echo Wife, which Oh my goodness. And also if you haven't heard the audiobook, it's just phenomenal. And uh my uh a, an author friend of mine, Natalie Jenner, wrote a fabulous novel that came out earlier this year, uh, Bloomsbury Girls. And uh, let me say that again, Bloomsbury Girls. <laughs> and I just I I one of the things I loved about it is she has real authors make cameo appearances in the book, and one of them is oh an author who wrote one of my favorite novels, Daphne du Maurier. And it made me realize that, my goodness, this woman has a whole body of work. You've read one book and love it to pieces. So I need to read more Daphne du Maurier. And I haven't decided exactly kind of which way to go yet. I have short stories. I have a couple of novels, uh, but that is like for sure on my summer to do or to read list. Yeah, Siren Queen. Oh. Yeah, that one's You read it? No, I haven't. That one's on my like want to read list. Oh. Yeah. And that cover, oh my gosh. Uh, Everything so... about it is just looks so enchanting. Yeah. And it's like incredible. almost haunting, but like beautiful. Mm. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> um <No. laughs> 
What is one book that you will always suggest to anyone who will take a book rec? Easy. The Raw Shark Texts by Stephen Hall. It's a book, whenever I mention it, I will say like 49 times out of 50, people have never heard of it. So it's great to recommend because, and then when they have, usually people are very excited because again, it's not a book a lot of people know or talk about. And if, have are either of you familiar with it or have you read it? Nope. <laughs> so I will give you like the super quick, we're talking like elevator going from the first floor to the second floor. It's Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind meets Jaws. It's weird okay. and wonderful and you will love it. I love that movie. So gonna check yes, it out. So yeah, gonna check that yes. one out. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, my turn. So sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, okay. Are any of the characters that you've created inspired by anybody in real life? For sure. For sure. Uh, I mean, I'd be lying if I said mm -hmm. I didn't. I will say I do try very hard to not um, model any character off of myself. At the same time, I think every character has me as some part of who they are and I think any writer who tells you they don't like they're lying um because you know it's like it's coming from me so it's just like you pass on your DNA you you're as a writer you pass on some of your writing DNA but um more specifically I would say that um, Madeline Una's mother in um Una Out of Order was very much inspired by my own mother um she also had me when she was young we had kind of like a she was 20 so when she when I was born so it was like a Gilmore Girls thing where we definitely you know she was always like just one of my best friends and I still talk to her every single week and try to see her as much as possible. And, um, but just that vivaciousness and, you know, I always think of her, you know, growing up and like having adventures with her going on vacations together and just having, and, and my goodness, she just has the craziest stories and, um, it's just always, um, it, it's so wonderful to have such a colorful character in your life. And at the same time, she has supported me and all of my crazy ideas my whole life. And, you know, she has called me a unicorn and for better or for worse. <laughs> uh, so, yes, you know, having um, I, I really having having her as my mother, I wanted to pay tribute to her and. I didn't even think of it, but subconsciously, her name is Ola, and you know I'm Margarita. And then I didn't even realize that I like kind of flipped. I had Madeline Una for mm -hmm. Ola Margarita. It was like completely sort of not not intentional at all. It was just, and I think she's the one who realized that too. Aww, like, oh, that's, that's so cute. So and yeah, and then other characters, you know. Uh, they're hybrids or, you know, like, let's say, you know, if a certain character that is, let's say, not as likable may share a nationality with some less than likable exes that I've had. <laughs> I won't name yeah. them. Um, <laughs> yes. They, they're charming and their wit is very dry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's so, funny. Uh, so yeah, I would say it's funny because a lot of times the characters that I most closely model after real people aren't people I know very well, but they're people that just struck me in some way, whether it's something about their personality or appearance. And because I have that distance, I can kind of add all of these different attributes to them. But people who I know very well, I don't think I'd be able to kind of write fictionally about them as well as effectively, you know? That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm going to skip question nine more. Okay. Okay. That's fine. How much research into magic and sleight of hand did you have to do before writing Acts of Violet? And then do you have a favorite magician you discovered during your research? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, I did a lot of research and my research took an unexpected turn because, you know, it started with just, okay, let's do the, the basic 
history of magic. And, you know, I read Jim Sotomayor is like one of the preeminent authors on all things magical, historical. Um, there's one fantastic book I read, Fooling Houdini, also helped give me kind of that overview baseline in a really interesting way. Then I wanted to kind of get more modern, like well, what's what's magic doing now that's like edgier and different. So this book, Magic is Dead, was a good glimpse into more contemporary uh, stage magic and or street magic. And what I, of course, I watched tons of clips, not just of magic being performed, but like how it's done, all of the magic secrets revealed. And then because I love podcasts, I started like listening to a lot of magicians being interviewed to get like the real insight into like, okay, what is their, their life really like their career trajectory like, and specifically because I was writing about a female magician, I was interested in the woman's perspective. You know, what is it like to be a woman in magic? And as I started to like sift through and narrow my focus, the question that I kept asking over and over again was, where are all the women? And I would scroll through and be like, here are interviews with magicians and be like, man, 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 woman. Okay, click play. And then I finally came across a podcast called Shazam that was created by two women who are both professional magicians, um, Kayla Drescher and Carissa Hendricks. And it was exactly what I needed. Their mission statement when they founded this podcast was, you know, it was to answer the question, what is it like being a woman in magic? And so I listened to every single episode. And then I reached out to a couple of magicians just on the off chance that somebody would like, and women specifically would be up for being interviewed. And to my great fortune, Kayla Drescher, one of the founders of this podcast, spent hours on a Zoom with me just answering my, I have pages and pages of notes, every little detail, every little minute question. And it was such a privilege. And I was so happy when uh, I could send her the finished book. Um, I remember one of the questions I asked her, I was like, what is something I can put into this book that when a professional magician reads this, they'll be able to say like, oh, she she did her homework. She knows her stuff. And to my surprise, she said, use the word knacky. We're always talking about how a trick is knacky or like this this effect is um, is not like so it's basically complicated or really tricky. But it's just that's the word that they use. And I wanted to make sure that I didn't kind of. I didn't want to overdo it. I use it in the book once and it's said by a career magician. And so when I sent Kayla a copy of the finished book along, you know, in my thank you note, because she's in my acknowledgments, of course, but in the thank you note, I said, I hope, you know, I, I used Naki and I hope I, I used it correctly <laughs> and in a way that would be, you know, appreciated or you know like i i hope i did you justice i hope i did i did right by you by all of you like magicians um so yeah it was it was a lot of fun and i i will also say that there came a point as as much of a treat as it was discovering like how david blaine does all of his crazy tricks i did purposefully stop researching at some point, like once I felt like I had enough knowledge, because there are just some things that I want to still be able to enjoy magic on the level of oh, how did they do that? That's incredible. That looks impossible. And, um, you know, even though I still enjoy the tricks the you know, when there's a really great effect that I, I can see how it's done or I can figure it out or I'm I've done that homework. I look at it through more of an artistic lens of like, oh, wow, their, their gestures here, their pattern, you know, so I, I still admire it from a performance standpoint, um, but I'm glad that there are still plenty of effects that can wow me because I don't know how they're done. <laughs> <laughs> um, on that, are there any magic tricks that you know how to do or have learned how to do in your research of this book? I'm going to be honest with you. I thought about teaching myself like one really, really great card trick to 
in the event that somebody asks me or maybe like as part of my book tour to be cute and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But to go back to the very first question, my physical dexterity is <laughs> not great. Yeah. And I felt like I would not be doing professional magicians justice by even mm -hmm. trying to like attempt a good magic trick. And I'm one of those people that like, if I'm not going to half-ass it, like if I'm not, if I can't do it yeah. well, I'm not going to do it. So I didn't go down that rabbit hole. And I, I think that we're all the better for it. Yes. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Um, Cards everywhere. Just picture everything. that. Everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, can you tell us a little bit about the Una series and have you had your hand in like the production of any of it? So it's currently in development. Uh, and I will say it's been a kind of a long process that I've been very, very fortunate to have had some involvement in it. I'm uh, what's called a consultant. So uh, in the early days, I was given scripts and even like I because I watch so much TV and like so many movies that I never thought I even said, like, I never thought like watching TV would prepare me if, like in any way and help my career in any way. But getting to know like screenwriters that I thought were great and submit lists of people who I thought um, could do a, a wonderful job. Uh, that was helpful. And also just, you know, it was fun to read scripts. Um, and it's, it's still currently in development. Um, I think just right now and, and projects can just take a while mm -hmm. to, get to that level where they're where they're in production so um you know the last i heard it's they're still working on that that pilot script and you know just there's things that you know they're just finessing it and my my whole mentality with it is you know when there's activity, whenever I get an email, I'm like, oh, can we all have a call? I get super excited. I get, you know, I, I'm always like, I'm ready. I'm as involved as you'd like me to be. And then it's always exciting and fun. And then whenever there's a lull, I just don't think about it. I don't worry <laughs> about it. And I just, I get on with the rest of my writing life and just wait for that next, that next note or call and, you know, just kind of take it as it comes in terms of casting if there was like one actress that you could have play mm. una do you have <laughs> i feel like you do <laughs> is there anybody that you would love to have play una if you could choose okay so my husband terry and i we have had we've spent hours like <laughs> fake casting especially una and uh i we both landed on the fact that because she can pretty much do anything emma stone would be amazing oh, okay um, yeah. and the, because my whole thing and you know again what amazon decides to do i will respect and they they know their stuff i would love i feel like for me, Una has big expressive eyes and that's something that like whatever age she is internally externally mm -hmm. Um, there's so much that is going to need to be conveyed non-verbally. And so I, I do picture an actress with big eyes. I've also thought about, um, is it Christina Miliotti? I think mm. her name is. She was uh, in Palm Springs. Um, she yeah. was just, start, I, I, I love her. I've lo I think she's such a great actress and she's really good at like playing flawed characters. And then I think Emmy Rossum could also do it because she's also got this, she's got the doe eyes, she's got the emotional range and um, and all of them can play. I think there's something special about an actress that can be flawed and make mistakes and still have the viewer rooting for them. And all three of those actresses, like even when they're being jerks on screen, I still <laughs> love them and I still like want them to to win out. So mm -hmm. I feel like that's I need that energy for Una. Or I hope I hope that we get somebody that has that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, I'm for really sure. excited about uh, seeing what comes <laughs> up and like 
what they put together. Me too. Uh, I'm like, you know, like, do you have, um, super quick, do you have like a newsletter that you send out to um, your fans? No, oh. I, I used to. And then I just realized that I spent so much time putting it together and it stressed me out so much oh, no. that like I just, and, and I was doing like all the social media and I realized like, you know what, I need to just do the social media that I personally enjoy the most. So, mm -hmm. so that's why I'm mostly on Instagram and, and Twitter, a little less on Twitter. Um, and then once in a while on Facebook. Okay. Well, um, so like any updates on anything you'll share on your Instagram? Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Just it'd curious. be like you'll sky riding. <laughs> <laughs> um oh uh, let's see. So in Una, she time travels. Um mm -hmm. what is something you'd like to experience from each decade mm. that Una traveled to? Mm. Or even just one? Well, I a big part of why I wrote this. I started to write this book is um, unlike Asleep From Day, where I got to revisit a time and place that I personally experienced, I've always felt like I was born 10 years too late and I was a child in the 80s. And I knew, you know, I got to experience some things, some of the movies and the music, but I knew that there was cool stuff happening that I couldn't directly participate like you know in the culture and especially like the counterculture the subculture like the oh the new romantic new wave post-punk goth like my goodness like to experience new york for sure london maybe la during the time period when like the music and the fashion and the art artistry of ev like everything was just enmeshed and so interesting and subversive and i don't know it's to this day a lot of my favorite music and you know films are are out of that time period so to kind of be able to go back and experience it firsthand that would be so cool like do you have you guys seen that um san junipero episode of yes uh, black mirror yes that literally is my idea of heaven like <laughs> A thousand percent. I, you know what? If we are living in a simulation and that is possible, plug me in. <laughs> me back to the 80s. Yes. Um. Do you have any two questions? Because I feel like we're getting a little close. So, do you have any two questions that you think you want to ask more? Me? Any other? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um. <laughs> You can pick one out and then I'll pick one. Okay. Um, <laughs> do you have anything in the works right now that you can share with us? So I am in the, in the early, early stages of like planning and packing uh, a new book that I, I've pretty much cleared the decks for August. I am trying to, so you, you ladies made it in right under the wire because I, <laughs> I blocked out August to fully, fully immerse myself mm -hmm. in this new project that I got, I've had the title and the hook for this book for almost 20 years now. Wow. Like I think about 18, because I, I remember it came about right yeah either right after I wrote the very 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 earliest draft of a sleep from day which is like again like started ages ago um and I periodically will check Amazon and Goodreads to see if that title belongs to any book and it doesn't and um I feel like I believe a lot of writers believe in this notion of this sort of shared creative wavelength cloud energy field whatever you want to call it where you know if you get an idea and you sit on it for too long it's going to be like a butterfly and it'll fly away and land on another author's shoulder and then too bad you know like you had your chance and you didn't take it and the fact that this idea and this title has stayed with me as long as it has and i have not acted on it yet i feel like if i don't do it now then somebody else will take it or it will never happen. And finally, I've had the premise and yet never kind of, I always 
sort of hit that wall of like, yeah, and, and now <laughs> the ands are coming. So I'm very, very That's excited. Exciting. That's yeah. so yeah. exciting. And, uh, and yes, of course, it's going to have like a weird little angle. I will say it's, if I had to pitch it without telling you exactly what it's about, think The Measure, you know, the new book, The Measure that came out meets the Midnight <laughs> Library. We Love last those. podcast literally just read The Measure for yeah. the podcast. Okay. And we so, loved it. Whoa. Yeah. And <laughs> what's so funny about The Measure is that in Asleep from Day, there's a character who talks about a screenplay that's about a society where people can find out when they're going to die and it divides basically it divides society into two groups those who know and those who don't know and then within the group of the people who know there are the people who are like dying soon and the people the long lifers and the short lifers mm -hmm. and there was a point a year or two ago where i very briefly thought hey should i develop that into a book no never mind oh look a squirrel you know and like i just didn't <laughs> And again, that butterfly flew away and landed on another author's shoulder mm -hmm. who wrote this huge hit book as a result. So yeah, it's uh, it's been really, it, I love kind of seeing how ideas take shape in the hands of different, different authors. I'm, I can't wait to read that because we love, yeah. love, we loved love both of much. those books. Yeah, those books. But yes. Well, so fingers crossed this one will live up to the hype that I apparently have just, I have like 2,000 <laughs> words, so I got a lot of work to do. <laughs> We're, well, we we are not going to be disappointed. Trust us. No. Yes. Yeah. We not will at all. Not be. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, what time is it? Okay. Um, what do you think makes a good story? I think... Above everything else, you can say a good hook, you can say characters, you can say a good plot, but nothing will ever beat voice because you can teach a person how to craft a compelling story. You can teach them the rules and the beats and what makes for an interesting, well-developed character and plot arcs and all of that. You cannot teach voice. And you know, the, there have been all kinds of breakdowns of the three story types or the six story types. Essentially, all of the stories have been told and are just being told over and over and over again. So what makes them distinct and, you know, what makes a story special is the nuance that a specific author brings to it and their point of view and their personality. So for me, especially when an author can take a topic that I never thought I would be interested in at all and write, I, I funny enough, a screenwriter comes to mind, but somebody like Aaron Sorkin, you know, I really, I have less than zero interest in sports. He writes a sitcom about sports and it's fantastic. Um, you know, back in the day, I was really not that interested in politics. Here comes the West Wing, one of the greatest television dramas of all time. And so he's a perfect example of um, a, a writer who, because he has such a strong voice and, you know, conveys his point of view and puts his stamp on something and makes it so compelling. Um, it doesn't matter what he writes about. He can just draw in the, uh, the viewer the way that a great author could draw in a reader. Okay. And then one last thing. Um, what's one thing you want to let your fans know uh, before we wrap up? Uh, that I'm living my best life. Thanks to all of you. And I like, that is, is no joke. I'm so grateful for all of the the wonderful word of mouth, all of the photos, all of the kind reviews. I mean, I write 
I've always been kind of set on not sticking to a specific genre. I've always felt like, you know, I, I flirt with genres. I won't be penned into a single box. And that's why it took longer for me to get traditionally published. And the fact that readers have embraced my stories, quirks and all, and, you know, have just been championing them and recommending them, um, that means everything to me. Like I, we would not be here having this conversation. So I am truly grateful every single day I wake up feeling like I have won the life lottery because I get to do the thing that I love most. And by some miracle, readers get to enjoy the fruits of that labor and, and seem to think it's not half bad. So, so <laughs> huge thank you. So, um, just to not take any more of your time. Um, so thank you for all of your time and thank you for uh, the books that you write. I know that Morgan and I find happy places in books and Una was one of those. Um, and Axe of Violet, of course. Um, but Morgan and I have definitely bonded over Una and we're going to mm -hmm. bond oh. over Axe when she's done. Yes. But we I hope you have a good, healthy debate over the ending. I know it's caused uh -oh. some, uh -oh. some, some differing <laughs> opinions, interpretations. Oh, no. and But I will say you will, you will have a reaction and you won't feel nothing. You will feel something. So, and I would rather <laughs> have readers. It'll make you keep thinking about the story afterwards mm -hmm. more than a different ending would no. without giving too much away so you know for yeah. better or for worse i think it will stick with you i hope so and uh, i think it will spark some conversation we'll definitely be talking about it on the next podcast episode <laughs> i started this book two days ago and I've been like so busy with scheduling stuff. And I'm like, no, I need to finish. I need to find out what's happening. <laughs> Before we got on this call, I was like, Danielle, I have a theory and I just need to run it by you. And she just looked at me and was like, <laughs> nothing, absolutely nothing. I, it's driving I, me nuts. I, so far, nobody, not one single, and I try to like not read too many of the reviews, mm -hmm. but so far I have not seen one where a person has guessed the ending even remotely. Uh, so, so there's that. And also I just urge you and anybody listening who has not read the book to just embrace the spirit in which it was written and the theme of the book, which is magic and magicians do not reveal their secrets. So I revealed as much as I could, but in keeping true to the spirit of the book, there had to be some secrets. I had to keep an ace or two up my sleeve. So just remember that. <laughs> this oh, makes me want to you're, get up very trepidatious <laughs> and then, well the fact that when you said nobody has guessed it and I've run a couple theories by Danielle and she's like yep I know I'm completely <laughs> completely wrong <laughs> yes you are I yeah I thank can't you wait thank you, you Danielle I can't even wait um, I'm very excited I can yeah. say also piggybacking off of what Danielle said when I was getting back into reading Una was one of the books that I read and I was like, oh my gosh, I need to own this book. And then hence Aww. all of this happened. Um, <laughs> yeah. But Una, I was just at the ending when it reveals, I don't want to spoil anything, but mm -hmm. when the reveal happens, tears. I was a mess. I cried writing that last chapter. Like oh. I, li I was like, Bleh, like no jokes. Yeah. So whatever you feel like I felt, I put right into it. So um, and, and with Violet too, if Violet's a very different book, um, but it, it was the same when people were telling me how Una was like this happy place for them. And, and it was for me to writing it. I mean, I wrote Violet during the pandemic, so I needed a happy place. Mm -hmm. And I was like, we all need a happy place. We all need more magic in our lives. Let me be as literal as possible about that. <laughs> <with my nephew. Yeah. laughs> Um, so I did want to try to kind of bring some kind of sense of wonder um, to to the story and kind of offer that sort of immersive experience again. Um, one more thing. 
Uh, I just want to <laughs> say that I really loved the addition of like numerology and like um, spirit mm. animals and all that stuff. I find that stuff so fascinating and like the numbers, like the repeating mm-hmm. numbers. Mm-hmm. Oh, I was like, this is amazing. I love all of <laughs> It's so cool and just so different. And I'm, I hope everyone reads it. And then I hope that everybody who listens to our podcast will go out and buy it, listen to the audio book, do everything you can to support Margarita because she's the best because she joined us two dorks and had an interview with us. Third dork right here. You know, we got the trifecta. It's all good. I Dorks are my people. So I take that as a total compliment. <laughs> um, so, yes, we really appreciate your time and all that you've had done for the reading world and whatnot. And so this has been boost and reviewed and i should probably say do you want to say anything before we leave because this is important (laughs) no thank you so much for having me this was a blast i i have loved this last hour and um i it's been a really nice respite from i'm kind of i've been back to work so it's been really really fun for me to just like take some time just to have a really fun chat so and again thank you for all of your support and, you know, just all of your kind words. Aww. Thank you. Yay. Well, thank you. And, thank you so much. Uh, so this has been Boost and Reviewed. And go buy Acts of Violet. Just do it. Won't regret it. Um, <laughs> and yeah. So um, where can they find you on Instagram? Uh, Instagram and Twitter. I'm Damiella. D-A-M-I-E-L-L-A because why use my real name? <laughs> <laughs> and then where can they find you, Morgan? You can find me at underscore bookmorgs underscore. Danielle, where can they find you? You can find me at Danny Allreads at D-A-N-I-A-L-L-R-E-A-D-S. Uh, thank you, everyone. And we'll see you in the next one. In the next one where we discuss cheers, Acts of Violet. Yeah! Yes, Woo-hoo! cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Bye.